All right, great. Uh, so thank you everyone uh, for tuning in to this week's uh, IDE seminar. Uh, we have a really uh, exciting talk lined up for today. Uh, we have Kartik Hasanagar from the Wharton School at uh, University of Pennsylvania. Uh, he's a professor of technology and digital business and a professor of marketing there. Uh, his research work focuses on the digital economy, in particular, the impact of analytics and algorithms on consumers and society, internet media, internet marketing and e-commerce. Uh, Kartik has a really amazing uh, CV, so he's done a bunch of interesting research, has co-founded and developed Core IP um, at uh, Yodel, which is a firm that was acquired by web.com. Uh, he's been the co-founder of companies, served on advisory boards, been the co-host of a serious XM show. So just tons of really interesting stuff. And uh, he has a really interesting talk prepared for us today about machine learning instrument variables for causal inference. Uh, so I will at this point uh, turn it over to Kartik and let him get started. Uh, just a quick note before that, please uh, turn off your camera and microphone during the talk. And then uh, we'll try to collect questions in the chat and then uh, go through them at the end. So uh, even if you have a clarifying question, just try to drop it there in the chat. And I think Kartik's going to keep an eye on that and we will hopefully uh, clear up any points of confusion that anyone has during the talk. So uh, thank you again, and thanks to Kartik, and uh, I'll hand it over to him. Hey, uh, thank you, Dave. Um, hope everyone uh, can hear me fine. Um, I noticed that I cannot turn on my camera. I assume that's by design and it's perfectly fine. Um, but let me know if uh, I'm missing Let me something. make sure let me change that. Okay. Uh, okay, thank you. Yep. And I'll go ahead and share my screen. And lastly, I'll keep my chat window open although it might i'm not a great parallel processor so not sure how well i'll do um, but I'll, I'll i'll keep a track of the chat window um so again uh thank you all for having me and thank you all for joining um so this is uh, ongoing uh, research on uh, machine learning instrumental variables for causal inference uh, this is joint work with uh, my phd student amandeep singh and uh, my colleague uh, amit gandhi uh, as Dave mentioned, most of my work is focused on uh, technology and uh, digital business. Um, so this paper is uh, somewhat different from my usual work. And uh, given the seminar series is on uh, the digital economy, uh, it's likely very different from the usual talk in the seminar series. So I want to maybe take a, a few minutes to just clarify um, how we got here and, and why we started um, uh, this work. So a few years ago, I started a series of studies looking at how recommender algorithms impact consumer. Uh, the prevailing wisdom at that time was that uh, recommender systems um, lower consumer search costs and help them find uh, products close to their preferences independent of uh, product popularity. This in turn would help us move from a world of hits to a world of niche products or in other words, the long tail. Now in a series of papers on this topic, some analytical, some empirical, uh, we found uh, quite the opposite. Uh, the most commonly used recommender algorithms, that is collaborative filters like Amazon's people who bought this also bought that, or Netflix's uh, recommender algorithms. Uh, we found that they tend to concentrate uh, sales towards more uh, popular items. And this is because collaborative filtering algorithms recommend items based on their past consumption. And so they cannot recommend niche items, even if they would be rated favorably. Now, this research uh, caused me to go deeper into the machine learning algorithms that are at the heart of uh, recommender systems. Uh, in more recent work uh, with Dokyun Lee and, and Harikesh Nair, we've uh, evaluated what content attributes of social media messages uh, by firms elicit greater consumer engagement. For example, what is the effect on engagement of using informative content, uh, meaning content that shares product information or price information versus brand personality content, meaning humorous content or emotional content and so on. And uh, we used a large scale data set of uh, 
over 100,000 uh, text and uh, image uh, messages on Facebook by over 800 of the largest brands on Facebook. Uh, and we used uh, standard uh, supervised ML techniques to content code these messages. That is which messages are informative, which ones have brand personality, meaning emotion, humor, and so on. And then we evaluated the impact of these on engagement and we found that brand personality content was positively associated with engagement and informative content was negatively associated with engagement unless they were paired with, uh, inf uh, with brand personality attributes. Now in a more recent study, um, we're trying to measure network effects in uh, mobile platform markets. Uh, in that study, we develop an IO model in which the demand for uh, phones is a function of hardware characteristics uh, like price and capacity of the phone and uh, which specific apps are available on that platform. And similarly, the demand for apps is a function of the installed base of the hardware platform and the software characteristics. Now, given aggregate market shares of phones and of apps, we then try and estimate the parameters of this model using uh, GMM uh, approaches. Uh, now the challenge in this model is endogeneity because of price and uh, product demand, as well as the simultaneity in hardware and software characteristics. And we use the standard IVs that are used in IO models um, to address this, but we find that sometimes those IVs can be, uh, can be weak. And we've spent some time thinking through how do we construct stronger IVs in a more data-driven manner and realize that the techniques we were thinking about are more general um, and applicable to a very wide class of empirical uh, problems. And so that is what led to this uh, study. And uh, with that, I'll jump into uh, this paper, uh, which is on learn machine learning instrumental variables. Now, one of the most critical challenges in applied empirical research, uh, especially in settings where you cannot run randomized experiments is how do you draw causal inference from observational data? Uh, the main uh, challenge is uh, endogeneity, which is uh, due to either omitted variables bias or a simultaneity bias or measurement errors or sample selection. Um, and to address this, instrumental variables are among the most popular or frequently used methods used by uh, researchers uh, in our fields. And uh, an instrumental variable essentially, you know, given some regression, let's say linear regression of the form y is equal to uh, beta x plus uh, epsilon, where x, um, the variable is endogenous. Uh, we're looking for an instrument z that is strongly correlated with the endogenous variable x but is uh, otherwise uh, you know, not uh, associated with the outcome variable or in other words, uh, uncorrelated with the error uh, uh, epsilon. And uh, this instrumental variable Z can help us partition the variance of X into an endogenous and an exogenous component. So with that, we can only use the, we can use the exogenous component to better estimate the parameters of interest. Now, in recent years, the use of endogenous um, or the use of IV methods has come under criticism in multiple disciplines. For example, Young in economics, Rossi in marketing, Hosman et al. in finance, and many other disciplines. Uh, because, and their main criticism is that the IVs that are used in practice are often weakly correlated with the endogenous variable. And weakly correlated IVs increase the variance of the estimator leading to an imprecise estimate of the uh, causal effect. Uh, furthermore, in an extreme case, when the IVs are, are weak, the asymptotics break down leading to bias in the estimates, rendering the whole exercise really uh, worthless. And so constructing strong instruments is a very important endeavor in, uh, for causal inference uh, based on observational data. And that is the question that we tackle uh, in this study. Uh, now, we approach that problem of constructing instrumental variables from exogenous data as a machine learning problem. Now, in usual learning problems, a decision maker must learn a decision rule 
from some uh, training data set, which is then applied to a test sample. Now, uh, the key empirical problem for the econometrician, which is distinct than the problem for a machine learner, is that in the, in the typical applied context, uh, the econometrician does not have the luxury of treating the data set in hand as the training data set uh, for the decision problem. Instead, the sample in hand is the only data set available from which both the instrumental uh, variables must be constructed and the causal inference must simultaneously be performed. So our algorithm addresses this issue um, and it has very strong uh, theoretical properties and it allows us to apply a very broad arsenal of machine learning methods for uh, IV construction. And so, you know, in this talk, I'll get into that. Uh, I don't have the time to go very deep into the relevant literature, but I'll quickly set up and merely state that uh, our paper fits into a growing stream of work that applies uh, machine learning in econometrics, although our focus is quite different from most of these uh, papers. Uh, the most closely related papers are the ones by Bai and Ang um, recently and by Belloni et al, uh, where they use uh, machine learning methods uh, specifically to select instruments from a very large set of candidate instruments. Now, unlike these papers, um, our approach tries to use machine learning in a very wide variety of settings, including linear or nonlinear models. And it allows a researcher to apply a very broad arsenal of uh, machine learning methods in IV construction, not IV selection, but constructing uh, instrumental variables given a set of candidates um, and using really um, uh, most of the off-the-shelf mach machine learning methods that uh, we might consider using. So um, with that, let me jump in and uh, describe our model and our algorithm. Um, and of course, if something is not clear, please stop me. I'm going to start by getting into the theory of this somewhat. Uh, you know, in a talk, it's always hard to do, get into hardcore economic metric theory, but I'll try and cover that. Uh, but then I want to spend some time on the application where I'll use both simulated data and some real world data sets and papers to illustrate the approach and its uh, applicability. Now I'll describe our approach using the GMM or generalized methods of moment, method of moments estimator because it's a very general framework for inference and almost all IV estimators, whether linear or nonlinear, can be cast as GMM estimators. Uh, but everything I say will be applicable to a, a simple linear regression or its IV equivalent, say the two SLS model. Um, and so uh, the, the, the insights will be applicable for linear models as well. And I'll in fact, at the end, talk about the linear model and, and explain how this is actually very simple uh, with the linear model. So with that, uh, let's jump into the GMM framework. So consider a structural economic model, which is characterized by a set of moment conditions, P uh, moment conditions of the form expectation of F of X, Z and theta is equal to zero. Where theta is a set of model parameters, it's a vector of model parameters that are to be estimated. Uh, X uh, refers to model variables, in other words, our data set. And Z is a set of inst candidate instrumental variables. Now we will consider a subset of estimators that are referred to as IV uh, uh, estimators. Uh, in other words, we are focused on the class of problems that use instrumental variables. And uh, these are estimators that satisfy strong exogeneity, meaning that the expected value of the error term uh, psi given the instrumental variable z is equal to zero. Um, so a strong ortho orthogonality between the errors and the uh, instrumental variable. This results in a set of moment conditions of the form of expectation of uh, psi dot product, the instrumental variable z is equal to zero. And so in the GMM IV estimators, these are moment conditions that are added to the given or existing set of moment conditions. And together, that is the set of moment conditions that one uses. 
Now, given these set of moment conditions, the goal is to make sure that all of these moments are as close to zero as possible uh, in our uh, sample or in our data set. And that's what the estimator is trying to do. It's trying to estimate the parameters, trying to make sure all of the moments are as close to zero as possible. Now, the, the usual approach is to minimize the weighted sum of squared moments. So you have this function Q that I've listed here, which is quite simply, uh, you know, uh, the weighted sum of squared moments. So the first term is the moment condition, the transpose W is a weighting matrix, and the, the, the third term is the moment condition again. Um, and so we're trying to minimize the sum of squared moments. And uh, under suitable conditions, the GMM estimator is consistent and asymptotically normal. Now, given strong exogeneity, it implies that if Z is a instrument, then any transformation of Z is, uh, which will denote as H of Z is also an instrument. In other words, given that expectation of the error psi given z is zero, it implies that not only is the expectation of psi dot product z zero, but the expectation of psi dot product h of z is zero. And uh, the problem faced by an econometrician is to choose an efficient uh, rule h uh, or a transformation h so as to minimize the asymptotic variance of the parameters theta that we estimate. So uh, essentially the optimal H is over all possible functions H minimize the uh, asymptotic variance of the estimator theta. Now in practice, estimating this optimal H is infeasible because this optimal H depends on the asymptotic variance uh, V, which is actually unknown and it depends on the true parameters theta, which can only be estimated once the instruments that we are using are known. And so it's a, you know, a chicken and egg problem effectively. Um, and so it's hard to actually solve that problem uh, for optimality. And in practice, a lot of existing papers, for example, the classic uh, BLP model uh, will provide some approximations for the optimal instrumental variables. Um, and these approximations are based on some assumptions about the model and assumptions about the optimal uh, instrumental uh, instrument structure. Uh, for example, the BLP style instruments uh, make some assumptions about, uh, you know, the characteristics of rival products, characteristics uh, uh, of uh, other products by the same firm and so on, and then construct uh, instrumental variable or transformations uh, based on that. Now, the approach that we're going to do, uh, use is to ask this question of what is this H and can we use machine learning to learn this uh, transformation H? Now, let me pause here for a second and just recap everything I've said so far. So I've so far, I've not said anything new. Uh, the framing I've used is a standard uh, economic model and uh, the transformations uh, of Z that can improve the efficiency of our estimated uh, parameters is what we're after. And the question is, what's the best transformation? So far, the literature has viewed that as an econometric optimization problem and used several assumptions to, uh, to try and solve it. And instead, we're going to frame this as a machine learning problem. So let me jump into that. So we are going to treat H as a, a machine learning method with some parameters eta that are unknown. And our goal will be to uh, estimate these parameters eta of the machine learning method. So H can be any machine learning method. It can be a polynomial function. It can be a linear regression, or it can even be random forests or neural networks or something like that. So we propose to estimate uh, H, uh, specifically estimate the parameters eta by minimizing the sample variance of the GMM estimator. So that's what I have here, which is where we're minimizing the sample variance of the estimator uh, and, and minimizing it over eta, uh, subject to a constraint. And the constraint is that the parameter theta 
is itself obtained from the GMM. So the theta is obtained by minimizing the GMM criterion function. And so that's what we have over here. Um, and again, this is a bi-level optimization problem, uh, meaning that each optimization problem depends on the other, uh, meaning that the uh, optimal theta depends on the choice of H uh, and the H which, is, which has parameters eta, that is obtained by minimizing the sample variance uh, V. And so that's what we're effectively trying to do. The good news is that recent work in machine learning has demonstrated that gradient descent methods can be used to solve these um, similar bi-level optimization problems really well. So our goal here is now pretty much to apply gradient descent to solve this problem. And so next I'll outline the steps of the gradient descent uh, to learn the MLIV uh, function. Okay, uh, I, I see a comment. I'll come back to that comment uh, a little bit later after I've described the method. Okay, so here's our uh, algorithm for constructing the optimal uh, instrument. First, we are going to select uh, some machine learning uh, method uh, H. And this can include any of a very large class of methods, including, including lasso, ridge, neural nets, gradient boosting, and so on. Uh, for example, if you use lasso, then this function H is effectively a linear function. Um, and that's what we're using. Um, and then the goal is that we initialize the parameters Eta of this machine learning method H. And so we choose some, and this could be arbitrary, or maybe you have some intuition and you choose good starting points. And so we use some starting uh, uh, parameters eta uh, and estimate an initial optimal instrument H given this eta naught. We will then apply this eta naught uh, and the resulting instrument H of Z and eta naught into the GMM criteria and estimate the initial uh, parameter estimates theta naught. And now given this, we will then use gradient descent to update, update the eta. So eta is updated using the old value of eta and the gradients that we can compute. Given the new value of eta, we compute a new set of instrument H. We plug that back into the GMM, compute a new theta. And we'll keep doing this until we reach convergence. So that's the, the basic idea of this, uh, this approach. And in terms of what is this uh, uh, function H that we're going to use, as I mentioned, it could be anything from lasso, ridge, elastic nets, neural nets, gradient boosting, and so on. And for each of these choice of H, meaning a machine learning method, there are parameters that are to be estimated that will be estimated using the um, the bi-level uh, the gradient descent approach that I just outlined and of course this leaves a question that every machine learning method has some hyperparameters that have to be estimated for example for a neural network it's the architecture of the neural network how many layers are we going to use in the neural network um, and for lasso, again, there is a penalty that we use uh, within the lasso. And what is that uh, penalty uh, parameter lambda? So we have to estimate the hyperparameter. And also we have to figure out which machine learning method H do we use? Should we use lasso? Should we use neural network? And so for all of that, we'll use the standard machine learning approach, which is that we'll use cross validation for learning the hyperparameters and for choosing the best machine learning method for any problem. Now, that's pretty much our approach. There is one potential issue that I haven't yet addressed. And that is that if we use a data set to learn our instruments um, and then use the learn in, learned instruments to conduct inference on the exact same data set, then we might not get consistent estimates. This is because that that condition we need that expectation of the dot product of psi and h of z should be zero may not be satisfied if you're estimating uh, parameters eta using the same data set and then theta using the same data set. And so this is a complicated issue 
fortunately, this is a, you know, we can borrow on some really interesting work in the sample splitting literature that has been done. And so our approach will be to estimate the machine learning method and therefore the instrumental variable H of Z using one fold of the data and then apply it for causal inference in another fold of the data set. And so by doing that, we can show that we have a method that is um, uh, asymptotically consistent. So let me describe how that works um, in, in hopefully simpler terms than I've done so far. So suppose I have a, a data set D and this data set consists of some endogenous variable X and uh, some instrumental variables of Z. Um, and now we split our uh, data set into uh, K different folds. Now for each uh, fold K, uh, we will denote fold K by using the notation D of D sub K. And the excluded data is DK complement or DKC. So what we'll want to do is for fold K, which is in red, we want to construct a new instrumental variable H of Z. So we don't want to use Z, but we want to do some transformation of Z. Um, and we'll call that H of Z and we want to construct that. And to estimate H of Z, we're going to use uh, the, the data set we have set aside, which is DKC. And we'll estimate it in that data set. And so what we're going to do in that data set DKC is that um, we will use DKC as the training data set and we will estimate using uh, gradient descent the function H, uh, which is the transformation. We will then apply the function H to the Z variable in our uh, fold, our focal fold, which is in red. And when we apply it to that focal fold, uh, what we will essentially do is construct a new instrumental variable um, in that fold, which will be H of Z. Next, we'll proceed to the second fold. And for the second fold, folds one, three, four, and the rest of the folds are now the training data set. We will estimate the instrumental variable in that, uh, in that data set that we are calling DKC, which is the, uh, the, the, the training data set effectively. And then we'll apply it to the focal fold uh, and construct a new instrumental variable. We'll repeat this for every fold and then we will now end up with uh, instrumental variables for each fold. Now, how many folds does one need? Uh, it's really up to the econometrician and in some ways depends on computational power available. Each row in the data set could be a fold or we could even just say, look, it's too much, it's computationally too intensive. And so we will just uh, break the data set into two parts and we'll estimate in one fold and then use that in the other fold. And hopefully this addresses the, the comment that uh, Michael uh, brought up. And this is really, you know, you could do it in two folds, you could do it in many folds. And we're learning using machine learning uh, in one fold, uh, what is the right transformation and then applying that instrument uh, in the other fold. And then we will essentially using this approach, construct the instrumental variable for the full data set. Now in our paper, we can show that this approach has strong theoretical properties. That is uh, under some mild regularity conditions, we can show that uh, you know, the estimates are both consistent and asymptotically normal. And furthermore, uh, we can show that this approach leads to an efficient uh, GMM estimator as long as the machine learning algorithm is mean square consistent, which uh, most of the uh, off, -shell, off, off the shelf machine learning algorithms. Not all of them, but many of the ones that we might consider using actually satisfy that. So uh, I finally, from a theoretical standpoint, want to convey one other uh, point here, um, which actually uh, for applied researchers is probably the most useful insight here, uh, which is that this is even though described for GMM, uh, can be applied to linear models. And in fact, for the linear models, there's a very simple interpretation and a very simple way to use this. So if you have a linear model of the form 
y is equal to theta naught plus theta one x one plus theta two x two plus epsilon the other uh, epsilon, where x one is an exogenous set of covariable uh, variables and x two is the endogenous variables, and you have the error term epsilon satisfy the condition that expectation of epsilon given some instrumental variable z is zero, which implies that expectation of epsilon dot product h of z is zero. And then the question is, what is this h of z? Now we can show that the optimal rule h of z is simply the h that best predicts x2 given x1 and z. And this is the idea behind two SLS, except that with two SLS, we are typically using a linear relationship between say z and x2. And what this um, is really telling us is let's figure out, let's apply all the off the shelf machine learning methods, see which one does the best job in predicting the endogenous variable X2 given X1 and Z. And let's apply that and construct instrumental variables that are hopefully stronger than what the standard 2SLS will do. And that's the only change that one would do instead of stage one of the 2SLS, instead of running it in the usual way, we would use a machine learning way to run it and run a bunch of machine learning models, pick the machine learning method that does the best job at prediction uh, using cross-validation as the criteria, and then, um, and then just plug in the, uh, the estimates uh, for X2, the endogenous variable into uh, the stage two. So now let me uh, go beyond the theory a little bit and talk about how this actually works in practice and what kind of an impact can it have uh, in practice uh, for uh, most of these real world cases we uh, might consider uh, using it. So uh, I'm gonna show you just uh, one simulation and it's for a linear model. In our paper, we have multiple simulations for linear models as well as a simulation for a nonlinear model. And we use the, the BLP model, which is uh, commonly used for demand estimation and a very popular model in economics, marketing, information systems, and so on. And so we've uh, run all of those, but for now, I'm just gonna focus on the, uh, a simple linear causal model. And uh, the case I will consider is a linear causal model where you have lots of weak instruments. This is a setting where uh, because you have a lot of weak instruments, uh, some of the standard approaches uh, for instrument selection, for example, Baloney et al, which uses lasso to try and select an instrument, uh, it will fail because uh, that approach requires strong sparsity, meaning that you've got lots of instruments but there is some subset of them that are strong, uh, valid and sufficient instruments. But when that strong sparsity assumption breaks down, the literature offers limited guidance on how to estimate uh, uh, you know, an instrumental variable. And the, the issue is quite simple that when you've got a lot of weak instruments, then techniques like lasso or boosting, they will tend not to select any variable or they will end up selecting all variables. And so it doesn't really help. So we will use our approach, which we call MLIV or machine learned instrumental variables to construct the IVs. The underlying assumption for the simulation is going to be that even though each of the candidate instruments is a weak instrument, meaning it's weakly correlated with the endogenous variable, uh, that we that there exists some transformation or some function h of all of these weak instruments which is strong, and so the question is can we find that strong instrument and then improve the uh, predictions? So the data generation process is um, as follows. So I have uh, you know this uh, data generating process where y is equal to theta zero plus theta one X plus an error E. Uh, the variable X is endogenous. And so we'll construct that variable X. The data generating process for that is X is given by pi zero plus pi one times H of Z uh, plus this other error term mu. 
E and nu, their relationship is its a normal distribution and uh, notice the term uh, sigma E nu, which is non-zero. In other words, that is what is driving the correlation between X and the uh, error term E. And that's why, because sigma E nu is non-zero, X is endogenous. Now, H of Z, the, date, the, the, the data generation process that we're going to use is simply uh, that there are 500 candidate instruments. So Z is a vector of 500 uh, different variables. And it's going to be just a uh, linear uh, combination of these uh, 500 variables to construct X. And the instrumental variable Z itself is drawn from a normal uh, zero, mean zero uh, standard deviation one uh, distribution. So that's our data generation process. Now, given this data generation process, the first thing we're gonna do is take the data that is generated using this and apply the standard two SLS approach, the standard approach that we would use in econometrics and try and estimate the variables. Now for uh, simplicity, I'm just gonna consider a few different cases here, although in the paper we've looked at lots of cases. So uh, we have two variables, theta naught and theta one, and the true values are on your left and uh, recollect that X is endogenous and therefore theta one is one of the main variables we are interested in and trying to see whether we can estimate theta in an unbiased way. And what you will see, for example, in the first case where theta naught is minus 0.9, theta one is 0 0.75, the bias of theta one is actually pretty high, 0 0.135, so a pretty high bias. And because theta one is biased, theta naught also becomes biased. And this is true in all these settings, almost by design. I've created a data set where, I've, where I have endogeneity and then I estimated using two SLS. Unsurprisingly, the estimates are biased. Next, we're going to use uh, MLIV. Now we could have used the Belloni approach where we select instruments using lasso. It fails, it doesn't work, doesn't really provide much value here because there isn't really one or, or a few variables that you can select that is strongly correlated. So then we use uh, the gradient descent uh, MLIV approach. And what you will see is that the bias in theta one is reduced by an order of magnitude uh, by using our approach. And the bias in theta one is reduced by an order of magnitude and therefore the bias in theta naught also reduces quite dramatically. Uh, the root mean square error improves. The, the standard errors um, are uh, pretty consistent and pretty good over here uh, when we use uh, this approach. The main point here being that uh, even though there isn't one IV that is strong or there's a few that we can select, there might be a transformation that works. Um, and so that transformation really does help. Uh, before I move on, let me just read a comment that has come in. So uh, please bear with me for a second while I just read that. Okay, so this is about a specific application where uh, the question is about demand estimation um, and there is some source of endogeneity in the demand estimation um, and can one remove the endogeneity by constructing uh, IV, IVs over there. If I understand the question correctly and, and please at the end, feel free to ask this again if I've not clarified it. And, uh, and indeed, you know, we are currently uh, running some applied uh, versions of this where we're looking at uh, it's like Nielsen scanner data and looking at standard demand estimation models that are used in marketing and uh, trying to apply this approach there. And one applies many instruments, could apply many instrument there from lagged variables, cost-based instruments and so on. And we can show in those settings that our approach can construct stronger instruments and better identify demand and true uh, preference. So I'll uh, you know, take this question because it's possible I misunderstood it. 
So let me now proceed to the last item I want to cover and then I'll, I'll open it up for uh, Q and A. And for this discussion, I'm going to use a well-known sort of classical paper and use that data set and that model and see what can our uh, approach do in that setting. And so the paper I'm going to look at is by Asimoglu, Johnson and Robinson from 2001. And in that paper, the researchers ask a question, which is whether variation in economic development across countries, and they measure economic development using uh, income per capita. Um, is variation in economic development, is that driven by differences in the quality of the institutions uh, that are there in these countries? Quality of institutions, meaning the rule of law in those countries or the, uh, how strong are the property rights laws and so on. And it seems like a reasonable question, countries with strong institutions might also be the countries, uh, because they have strong institutions, they might have greater economic development. But it is also possible that economic development is what leads to better institution. Economic development allows countries to start focusing on the institutions and build better institutions. And so that's what is leading to endogeneity. We could run a regression model where we look at income capita uh, per capita as the dependent variable, look at the quality of the institutions as the independent variables, run that regression, estimate it, but we are not able to causally identify the impact because the, it could be really reverse uh, causation there. And uh, the authors therefore use a instrument to try and address this. And the instrument they use is a very interesting and not so obvious instrument and even questionable instrument. Their instrument is they use the mortality rates that were experienced by the first European settlers when they entered the colony as an instrument for the quality of the institution today. And so you kind of start to wonder, hey, what is the mortality rate of European settlers 200 years back when they first entered some country? What does that have to do with the quality of the institution today? And their theoretical argument is that the settler mortality rate affected the colonization strategy, which in turn affected the path of institutional development which in turn resulted in the quality of the institution that is there today. And they further argue that the settler mortality rate should have no effect on the income per, per capita today, except for through its effect through institution. Now, it's not clear whether this is true or not. They ran the analysis and they ultimately concluded that uh, indeed uh, the quality of institutions uh, do have an impact on uh, the income per capita. And it's all, the entire analysis is based on having a strong uh, or having a good instrument. Now in recent years, that paper has come under some criticism because of weak IVs. And in particular, in many of their specifications, the FSTAT falls below uh, 10, which was the threshold suggested by Staker and Bound. And it's a commonly used rule of thumb for strong instruments. And in some of their specifications, it goes below 10. Their model is specifically as follows. You've got the log of the income per capita, which is a function of uh, R, which is a measure of the quality of institutions. Specifically, R is a rights measure, and that's their key uh, independent variable they're looking at. And then you've got a bunch of other exogenous variables X in there. Now, R itself is endogenous. And so then they assume that the quality of the institution, that is the protection from expropriation R, is a function of Z, which is the logarithm of the settler mortality rate. And so that's their instrumental variable that they apply. And then they run this regression um, and their estimates are here. They run a bunch of different models. Uh, what varies across these models are uh, the samples, uh, data points that they're going to consider using and also uh, which independent variables they throw in there. Uh, now we ran the same model 
uh, using MLIV as well. What I will highlight here uh, for a moment is that if you'll see the last row here, which is the FSTAT, for the first two models, the FSTAT is above 10. It satisfied the rule of thumb, but for all the other robustness checks that they did, the FSTAT falls below 10. And that's been part of the criticism that it's not clear that the results are robust to all these additional tests they're doing because it's actually failing this rule of thumb measure. And so we ran their exact same model using our machine learned instrumental variables. And uh, we come up with slightly different estimates than their model. And few things to note here first is that while their F stats in the model um, often falls below 10, our F stats are for most of the models are above 10 and for every model the F stat is higher than theirs. Uh, furthermore, uh, in their model, if you look at the constant term, which is right above the uh, red box, the constant term is not identified in their model. In our model, MLIV, the constant term is identified. And then if you look at the, the parameter of interest, which is the, uh, the ones that I've currently highlighted, our estimates are lower than their estimates. So our uh, model suggests that having stronger IVs, which is also seen through the FSTAT, uh, we find that they might have overestimated the impact of uh, institutions on income per capita. And furthermore, their weaker models where FSTAT falls below 10, uh, models three, four, five, six, these are the models where in fact their estimate goes up quite dramatically uh, in those models. And the estimates are, are much higher in those models. In contrast, those are the very models uh, in which, you know, our estimates are generally more stable across the different specifications. So I've uh, rushed through some of this, um, but I think it's a good time to open it up for discussion and your questions. Uh, in, in terms of a summary and conclusion, I'll uh, merely recap that what we are finding is that uh, MLIVs are a very valuable tool to address an issue that almost everyone who uses observational data has to face, which is these endogeneity issues. And we find that this approach really improves estimates. Um, we have strong theoretical results to show that it can improve the estimates. Uh, furthermore, we can apply this approach for a very wide class of econometric models, not just linear models. And we can apply a very large class of machine learning methods. So we are currently working on really creating a code that any researchers can download and use. Um, so we have just begun that work. Our hope is that in a few months, we are able to release that code in uh, you know, some libraries in R uh, and Stata that can be used at least starting with the linear model and later for nonlinear models in Python. So with that, let me stop here for a moment and take any comments and questions that you folks might have. Awesome. Uh, thank you so much, Kartik. Uh, everyone, um, if you have questions, just uh, you know, drop them into the chat, and then I'll um, you know, help moderate this discussion. Uh, to get things started, one, one question that I had, um, Kartik, uh, you motivated this work, um, I think, by some of the work by people like Peter Rossi, sort of pointing out the issues with IV. Um, like, what's your sense of you know, how good of a job does MLIV do at actually solving these issues? Like, are there still cases in which even if you're using MLIV, you know, you maybe have some issues with like using instrumental variable uh, estimation for causal effects? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so I'll approach that in two ways. The first is that um, if you look at some of the criticisms like the Rossi paper, um, if you look at most of these papers, researchers have strong theoretical arguments for why something is an IV. But in practice, uh, those instrumental variables are weakly correlated with the, um, with the endogenous variable. And the nature of the relationship is also unknown. So they make some assumptions, maybe there's a log linear relationship and so on. Um, and so what ends up happening is that even if the theory is sound, you end up, if you look at the endogenous variable X, you're losing most of the information because you've chosen a weakly correlated 
instrumental variable and you've just extracted some portion of the variance in X, which is truly endogenous, but it's so weakly correlated, you've used so little of it that in practice, it doesn't get you much. And so you have imprecise estimates, your biases and so on. And that's been the criticism. And the good news here is that when we apply it in practice, We've, as I said, I just showed it to you for the AJR paper, where in practice we are seeing the F-steps are lifting and uh, you're finding at least some of these rule of thumb approaches are suggesting that we've got a stronger instrument that we are creating using that. And that's a setting where you've got just one instrumental variable and one endogenous regressor. Now you take this to an IO model, you know, these random coefficients, uh, uh, logit models like BLP and, uh, you know, many other, uh, panel uh, models, and you start to see over there, there's a whole lot of machinery. There are dozens or hundreds of instrumental variables coming in. And over there, the impact they can have is actually even more significant. And we're seeing, you know, very significant uh, lifts in that. Um, so in our conclusion, this can be a very strong tool. And of all papers that I've written, I'm actually the most excited about this because of in so many settings, we are seeing that this can really change, uh, you know, the result for um, a researcher in terms of going from weak IVs to strong IVs. The second, of course, is I did not address this question of, uh, you know, I only looked at the one condition, one of the conditions for uh, and instrumental variables, which is how is it correlated with the endogenous variable X? I did not address the other one, which is uh, how is it, uh, is it really independent of the error term? And there isn't a strong econometric test for that either. Um, and so for that, you know, we're not solving that problem. We're saying you need uh, instruments that are valid, that are uncorrelated with the error term, but we'll help you figure out what is the relationship between your instrument and your endogenous variable and preserve as much information that is exogenous as possible so that you get the most precise estimates. Got it. Um, great. And then one quick follow-up question. Uh, so you mentioned uh, that there are all of these different uh, machine learning algorithms that you can imagine using, right? You could do a linear model with lasso or a ridge regression. You could do a neural net, et cetera. Insofar as it seems like the objective of MLIV is to do as good of a job as possible at uh, predicting the really, you know, the relationship between your endogenous and variable and your instruments, is there any reason why you would prefer uh, like a simpler machine learning model? I, I feel like in machine learning practice, you're usually looking at interpretability versus, you know, ability to predict well, but it seems like here maybe I don't care as much about interpretability of the model. I just really want to do as good of a job at prediction as possible. Yeah, again, great question. Uh, so I, th I think, again, there's two different ways to look at it and they're opposing and I'll, I'll first clarify those two opposing forces and then share my view on it. So one argument would say that let's use the simplest possible ML model because then we truly understand and can interpret what is the relationship between Z and, and X. Um, and so that would be the argument for using the simplest possible model. The other argument would be, well, really what you're after as an econometrician is not the relationship between X, Z and X, between the instrumental variables uh, and the endogenous variable. What you're after is the relationship between X and Y, uh, between the dependent variable Y and the endogenous variable X. And if that's what you're after, you don't care about the relationship between Z and uh, X, it was just a means to an end. And so let's use the best performing machine learning method. And if it's a neural net, so be it. Because it's helping you get more precise estimates in, in the coefficient that you're interested in and therefore allows you to do better interpretation of that model, which is what you're going after. So it gives you greater interpretability, greater insight of the econometric relationship or the economic relationship that you're actually interested in estimating. My viewpoint is more of the latter, which is that if we look at it from a two SLS kind of model, stage one is part of the machinery. It's not the end goal. It's part of the machinery for me to get to uh, 
the true causal relationship. And therefore, I should feel free to use a random forest or a neural net or what have you. Got it. Very interesting. Uh, it looks like we have one question that's asking about the impact of choosing, say, random forests as opposed to linear models. But I think that's pretty similar to the conversation that we were just having. Um, and then. Uh, yeah, just one clarification on that. Um, is that the output of the random forest that we're most interested in is, you know, say in the, say in the linear stage two is the prediction or the estimated value of X2 of the endogenous variable. And so we just plug in that predicted value and that's what we're interested in. But, but yeah, I think we address that linear versus say a random forest. Yeah. Got it. And then, um... Maybe uh, the person who wrote this question could clarify, uh, or, or maybe you understand this a little bit better than I do, but just is there, is the, does the ML model help to reduce the risks of cognitive and cyber security and how? Um, yeah, yeah I, I think it's unrelated to this talk. I mean, I think it looks like it's a more general question of how machine learning can be applied to cybersecurity and, uh, yeah. you know, and, and the answer is yes. And there's a lot of great applications going on today, but yeah, it's sort of unrelated to this talk. Yeah. Um, great. All right. Here's a question. So just to clarify, the application here was for finding uh, the one theoretically motivated instrument. Uh, can it also be applied to cases with a variety of candidate instruments? Yes. Uh, so I went through two applications. The, the last application, the second application I went through was the AGR paper where they had one theoretically motivated instrument. They did not know the relationship between that instrument and the endogenous variable. And they used a log linear kind of specification. And we said, why use log linear? Let's use random forest. Let's use neural nets. Let's use everything that we can. And then we figured out a transformation of Z uh, that worked well. Now, the other application I looked at, which was a simulation, so uh, it was not theoretically motivated, but the setting was that there were 500 candidate instruments. And my endogenous variable was constructed based on these 500 instruments. And if it turns out that one of those 500 is strong, then you could use Lasso as an instrument selection method. And that's where Belloni is a, uh, an amazing paper that really uh, suggests how one could apply that. Uh, but however, if, if that's not the case and you've got a lot of weak instruments and you've got a, as, as uh, uh, John Green puts it, you've got a variety of candidate instruments, uh, then indeed it is the case that our approach can combine them to construct one strong super instrument, quote unquote, that actually will do a great job that best combines these information. And for some of those instruments that are not good, it's not going to use that information for some of them that are good, meaning they're correlated, but they're weak. It will combine them with others and construct one strong instrument out of that. Got it. All right. I have two more uh, quick questions for you, uh, for me, I guess, and, and then we'll uh, wrap up. So one, um, I noticed that, I guess in the simulation, uh, the MLIV estimates that you showed were less biased, but I, it looked like the variance on on those estimates were about the same. And maybe I missed this, but obviously if you have um, sort of like a biased IV estimate, it seems like ML IV helps. Is it also helping at all in terms of the, uh, the variance of your estimators or is it maybe both depending on the exact problem? Yeah, so again, uh, great observation. Um, it is indeed the case that ML IV will help you reduce the variance of the estimate. And the theoretical rationale or reason for it is that you know, I've got some uh, variables X um, and I'm trying to figure out how does it affect my variable Y. Now X is endogenous, so I use Z, which is some exogenous portion of X. Now the less correlated Z is with uh, X, the, the less of the information of X I'm using, the less is the variability in X. And so my estimates are imprecise. And so the variance of the estimates increase. But if I have a strong correlation between Z and X, meaning a strong instrument I've constructed using MLIV, then I've preserved more information, got more precise estimates. And so the standard, the variance of the estimates will go down. Now you're right, your observation is correct that in that model, 
the standard errors of our MLIV were not very different than the standard errors of the two SLS. And there's an interesting reason why that is the case, because the two SLS wasn't, wasn't the right model to use in the first place, because we had very high amounts of endogeneity. I used two SLS, um, and my instrument was very weak. So the two SLS was highly biased. And when you've got a highly biased estimate, it doesn't matter what's the variance of that estimate. It's just your estimate is off. And the variance it's giving you is also off anyway, because the whole thing is off. So the, you had no business using two SLS. So that's why I focused more on the bias and said, look, the bias is an order of magnitude lower. Our standard errors were good is what I was saying. It was no lower than the two SLS um, standard errors or uh, the variance of the estimates, but that's because two SLS was biased and off and those are not useful estimates. Got it. Is, is there also potentially something going on with the standard errors there in that, I guess if you're doing this uh, sample splitting and doing cross-fold validation, which is good for making sure that our estimates are unbiased, but I can imagine insofar as your sample size is essentially going down, that might also increase the standard mm -hmm. error. So there's like these two countervailing forces at work? Not quite. Um, the reason is that when I do sample splitting, and let's say, say I'm talking about a simple example where I split into two groups. I'm using group one to estimate the instruments for group. I'm sorry, I'm using group two to estimate the instrument for group one. And then I use data partition one to estimate the instruments for partition two. And now I've got a new set of instruments and then I have the combined data set. And that's where I can do, let's say again, in the two SLS version, I can now do stage two. So I'm using the full data set now. But for any, for any given row, the instrument in that row was computed not using that data set, but by other stuff. So you've got that independence created, but then you're not losing the data. And got the Jack Knife estimator, a bunch of these sample splitting ideas, and again, brilliant idea we cannot take credit for, but we borrowed it, um, is an idea proposed by Angrist and a few others. And so that's what we use. So we don't lose data per se because of that. Uh, of course, there's a question of how many partitions and so on. Right, all right. One last question and then we'll wrap up. So um, A. Blasco asks, um, so in the first step of the algorithm, you're choosing which machine learning algorithm to work. And so does that uh, step in the process increase the researcher degrees of freedom and maybe lead to issues similar to p-hacking or, or something like that? <laughs> Interesting. So yes, in, in that first step, you do have more degrees of freedom because you can uh, use any machine learning method. And within a class of machine learning methods, you've again got lots of hyperparameters you can you have. Um, you have to worry about overfitting as in standard machine learning, and then therefore we use uh, cross validation to figure out or to ensure we're not overfitting. However, what is interesting is that this stage of the estimation is a prediction step and it is not a um, causal inference step yet, right? Because we're trying to extract effectively, and again, I'll use the two SLS analogy because it's easy to um, think about that. In stage one of the two SLS, we're coming up with estimates of the endogenous variable. Uh, so we're coming up with X hat using the instrument Z. And yes, the better the predictions, the better the estimates, the better and the more, in, more exogenous information you can preserve, the better the next stage happens. And so that prediction step, because it's a predictions problem, it doesn't have that issue. Now you bring up an interesting question of p-hacking, which I, my reaction is it, it doesn't matter because the p hacking equivalent or really what you're interested in is the estimates in stage two and in stage one we're just trying to preserve as much of the exogenous information as possible and by applying all these methods we're able to do that but that is not effectively p hacking it's just extracting as much information as possible out of the data that is exogenous so yeah it shouldn't lead to p hacking we have to think harder about are there ways in which this approach could be misused Amazing. Uh, well, thank you again so much, Kartik, uh, for this talk. Um, this is super interesting. Uh, I can't wait to use MLIV for my papers, uh, you know, once you guys open source that package. So I'm looking forward to it. 
Uh, so yeah, let's let's give Kartik a digital round of applause. Uh, thank you again for the talk. And uh, just a reminder to everyone that next week we have uh, Bo Cowgill from Columbia Business School. Uh, he's done a lot of really interesting work on um, algorithmic fairness and application of algorithms to various sort of people analytics problems. So um, certainly he'll have a lot of really interesting stuff to tell us about next week. Right. Thanks.